Well, good evening, everyone. Dr. Chris Sapienza back for another great webinar with who I call the world famous Dr. Georgia Melandraki with us tonight. I know there's lots of people signing on as we speak. We have a lot of folks interested in dysphagia innovations with Dr. Melandraki is going to speak about tonight. Uh, obviously, Dr. Melandraki's work covers swallowing disorders, swallowing physiology. She is a professor of speech language and hearing sciences at Purdue University. I've known her for a long time. We've known each other for probably a good 15 or 20 years, but she's really grown into her own in terms of her work in Swallow and in neuroscience. And, and tonight, I think you're in for a real treat because you're, you're hearing from our current president of uh, DRS, as well as just a, a, a high-end scientist, an innovator, an entrepreneur, who tries to bring together her knowledge of science with product development. And really these webinars are for the clinician to keep you up to date about what's going on and what can be used in the clinic. So Georgia, good to see you tonight. We really welcome hearing your lecture and we look forward to everything you're gonna to speak to us about tonight. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Sapienza. It's a great honor to be here and to participate in this webinar series. Um, I've been a big admirer of Dr. Sapienza's work for a very long time, so uh, it's wonderful to get a chance to uh, be part of these webinars. So welcome to everybody, um, and uh, I think we're ready to get started, right? We are ready to go. Okay, wonderful. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, as I said, I'm really excited to be here today. I'm planning to share some information on swallowing neurorehabilitation, which is one of my favorite topics, and also share a couple of uh, uh, pieces of work that we are currently doing in my lab and uh, really um, looking forward to hearing your questions, ideas, and, um, and opinions on things. So with uh, that, so these are my financial and non-financial relevant disclosures for today's talk. For those of you who may not be familiar with my work or with uh, what I do, um, I have just, uh, uh, I'm providing this summary slide that basically uh, describes the four main areas of research that we do in the Produa Eat lab, my research lab. Uh, our main mission is to better understand how swallowing is controlled by the nervous system, by the brain and the muscles, and use that information in order to develop uh, treatments that are gonna be based on this neurophysiological, neurophysiological knowledge and hopefully be uh, more effective for our patients. In the last few years, as some of you may know this already, and especially since COVID started, another area of rather primary focus uh, in our lab has also been the area of telehealth and wearable technologies. So I will be uh, sharing uh, some aspects of both of these lines of research and work uh, that uh, um, I think um, you will hopefully find interesting as well. All right, so here's what we will cover today. As I said, I'm going to first introduce the topic of swallowing neurorehabilitation. I'm gonna primarily focus on motor rehabilitation of swallowing, not because I don't believe that the sensory system is very important for swallowing. I do very much so, but the reality is that most of the information we have uh, and most of the evidence that we have um, for the rehabilitation of swallowing comes or includes the motor, motor components of the swallow sequence. So we have a lot more evidence for that part. So we're gonna focus more uh, there. I'm gonna talk about different goals and avenues to achieve effective swallowing neuro, neuro rehabilitation and also ways to comprehensively evaluate um, the motor system as well as the nervous system and all areas that are involved in swallowing in order to reach targets and treatments that again will be effective for our patients and in the context of talking about those types of evaluation and treatment modalities, I will then share a few, a couple of innovations that we're currently very excited about. And, um, and then we'll, we'll, we should have time for questions and answers at the end as well. All right, so first of all, um, uh, the goal of swallowing neurorehabilitation is to enable patients with primarily neurogenic dysphagia. I'm, give, I'm, I'm using them as an example, and they are the main population that I've, I have been studying. Um, the ways that they, uh, they can recover in their swallowing function, or they can gain functional swallowing independence. So that's our goal, all right, is to ensure that our patients can swallow functionally again. But there are a couple of different ways that that can be achieved. 
And uh, two of them are highlighted here. They can be achieved either, uh, that can be achieved either through what is known as recovery or true recovery or through um, motor compensations. So there's a little bit of a difference between these two terms and a rather important difference. When I'm talking about true recovery, and I'm going to explain this using a clinical scenario, uh, let's say we have a stroke patient who suffered a stroke and a cortical stroke and ended up having um, a deficit in their swallow. Um, and, but by three months after the stroke, their swallow has completely returned to the pre-deficit, pre-stroke level. Uh, so when that happens, we have clinically full recovery, right? And that is driven by a neurophysiological recovery. What is that? That means that the same areas that were active when this person swallowed before the injury, the same or surrounding areas are active now when the patient is able to truly recover. In the same patient scenario, if that patient was not able to regain the ability to uh, swallow exactly the same way they did before the injury. Um, so for example, let's say three months later, uh, they still need, let's say a hard swallow, an effortful swallow or a head turn to be able to swallow. That means that they're using what are known as motor compensations, right? Um, and clinically we can see that or functionally uh, very well through our you know, imaging studies that we typically do. But if we had the ability to also look at brain activity, we would see that those motor compensations elicit brain activity from other brain areas that are not typically involved in the swallowing sequence. So when we, when we do not fully or, or truly recover, the brain uses additional resources. So in addition to the extra movement or extra patterning that is being used at the, uh, at the peripheral level, also the brain is, let's say, wasting a little bit more energy than it should, right? And more resources than it should. So definitely that's one of the reasons why we do not want our patients to be on motor compensation for a very long time, if at all possible, right? Um, and we want to target true recovery. So how do we do that? Through um, years of uh, knowledge from exercise physiology literature, kinesiology and rehabilitation uh, science literature, we know that um, ways to optimally achieve this true recovery are summarized on this slide. So if we're talking about improving muscle performance as a goal, like strength or power or endurance, using therapeutic exercise and using it in a way that will be effective, meaning applying exercise physiology principles would likely help patients fully recover. Or if we're talking about uh, skills or, or a set of sub skills um, that complete a specific task, that have been, are not very accurate or are not very well coordinated, then we're talking about improving motor skill performance. And in order to do that, you need to abide by other very important principles, principles of experience dependent plasticity and motor skill learning. And hopefully a lot of these, a lot of these uh, terms are very familiar to you. If we're talking about uh, sensory deficits, then there is something known as sensory retraining that is also possible. And again, because the focus today for, for this presentation is on motor neurorehabilitation, I'm not gonna focus on sensory retraining as much, but I did wanna mention that there are sensory retraining approaches as well. Now, in order to be able to, um, uh, to uh, target which one of these areas we should be selecting for our patients, uh, what do we need? Well. I really like this quote by one uh, uh, of my good colleagues and friends and also motor control expert, Dr. Andy Gordon and his colleague from a publication back in the day that says that evidence-based rehabilitation programs need to be developed upon the knowledge of the nervous system function and control of the, over the motor task that is being rehabilitated. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that we need to very well understand the neural control of swallowing and all its levels in order to be able to build evidence-based programs um, uh, based on that knowledge. So the first thing that we need to do, you need to make sure that we understand and know really well or the muscles, sensory receptors and areas, cranial nerves. I know the favorite topic of everybody, right? Um, the brainstem circuitry and the center pattern generators involved, as well as the uh, cortical and subcortical areas involved in the swallow, in the normal swallow sequence first. We need to have a very good understanding of these components because in essence, as clinicians, what we're asked to do 
is the following. We are asked to evaluate, first of all, the level of involvement. At what level is the disruption occurring if we're talking about a neurogenic dysphagia patient, for example? Are we talking about the muscle level? Are we talking about a lower or an upper motor neuron lesion? Are we talking about parts of the extrapyramidal system like the basal ganglia, for example, or other extrapyramidal systems? So at what level has the disruption occurred? But importantly, because at, at that level will, det will probably cause different motor features uh, uh, in our patients and motor, motor characteristics um, and symptoms for our patients. In addition to knowing the level, we also need, very, very important as well, to understand the type of involvement. Because it's very different if, if we're talking about a focal stroke, you know, hemispheric stroke um, um, in uh, ischemic, I'm sorry, a uh, focal ischemic stroke in the basal ganglia area. And it's different, we're talking about dopamine depletion in the basal ganglia and surrounding areas that cause Parkinson's disease, right? There's, two different, com completely different mechanisms that we need to be aware of um, and, and be able to evaluate and understand really well. In addition to knowing these things, we also need to be able to evaluate what parts or components of the motor system have been affected in order to know if we need to target them. What do I mean here? Well, if we're talking about reduced muscle bulk and strength, then maybe strength training or endurance training, for example, which is different than strength training, but, but, but it's their first cousins in some way, right? Um, maybe what you need to be targeting and the, the exact low, load you're gonna use will depend on the level and type of disruption and involvement of the nervous system that we talked about earlier. But if it is, for example, a coordination issue, an accuracy issue or a speed issue, maybe we need to engage another type of approach or skill-based type of approaches. If it is a muscle tone issue, there's not really much we can do through muscle performance training, but there may be stretching or passive type of approaches or medical treatments that we need to uh, refer for or target. And the same for abnormal movements like tremor, chorea, things like that. Um, again, skill-based approaches may be actually um, useful in some situations but in reality, compensations or medical treatments may be the appropriate, uh, the appropriate course of action. So it is important that we are able to identify and evaluate all these different components as well as we can. And here's a clinical, a couple of clinical scenarios to bring this uh, home really. So, um, so I'm gonna play these videos first and then I'm gonna reveal what types of patients these are. Um, but here we have two different patients that have a very similar symptom under video fluoroscopy. Um, so here's one. Okay, I'm gonna play it one more time. So I hope you will all agree that the main symptom here is what? Maybe you can write, you can type on the chat. I'll give you a few seconds. So if you can identify the main symptom that we see here. And you will see a very similar symptom in this second patient here as well. Again, they're swallowing also the same consistency. So a semi-solid bolus. So we have one person that said reduced PES transit UES constriction, okay. UES opening. Okay. Residue. Residue, right? Yeah, yeah. So the, the first person actually gave us a physiological component, which is great. I was asking for just the symptom, which I was, I was looking for the residue component, but these are both great, wonderful. Um, so th they both have pharyngeal residue primarily on the, in the molecular space, but you know, um, in some other parts uh, of the pharynx as well, right? Well, uh, and, and some of you may think, oh, maybe they need the, the same or similar treatment approaches. Well, one of them is a right hemisphere subcortical stroke focal stroke around, around or close to the internal capsule area of the brain. The other one is a patient with Parkinson's disease uh, about a year after her diagnosis. So we're talking about different level of involvement, different pathophysiology, and then in terms of what motor components are involved, actually the video fluoroscopy or fees, as a matter of fact, will not give you that information. So in order to be able to, uh, to identify what motor components are involved, that's where you need your clinical knowledge, a good cranial nerve exam, and ideally access to some other tools, like for example, manometry. So unfortunately, 
the, the imaging modalities we have right now are not optimized to be able to, to help us evaluate motor components. So just something to keep in mind, right? So, so then once we have evaluated all these components, we need to decide what level and what motor components are we targeting? And as I said, and this is kind of summarizes some of the things that I already said before. So if we want to improve muscle performance, Again, what type of muscle performance? Are we interested in strength, power, or endurance? Uh, or if we're interested in skill or improving some sub-skills of the swallow sequence, for example, chewing or um, uh, moving the tongue and mo moving food with the tongue, for example, that's, that's a skill. Laryngeal vestibule closure, you know, things like that. And we need to improve accuracy or coordination of different events and muscle groups or the speed of a specific event, especially when it's very slow, then we need to look at skill-based training approaches that typically require higher levels of uh, involvement as well. So the, um, the reality is that, so we know what we need to do, but how do we ensure that we select appropriate targets and apply some of these principles that I said, talked about earlier, exercise physiology and principles of neuroplasticity and motor learning uh, effectively for our patients? Well, through comprehensive evaluations, and really we need to be thinking about tools beyond BFSS and fees. BFSS and fees are wonderful tools. They have nothing against them, but uh, by themselves, they uh, give us limiting information. We need to, uh, to do a lot more in order to be able to be effective rehabilitation therapists. It's different if you wanna just compensate for the swallow problem, right? Which we already said, we don't wanna do that. If we wanna rehabilitate and help our patients um, fully and truly recover, we need to be looking at additional tools. All right, so we need to do our comprehensive evaluations and a lot, I'm sure that all of you or a lot of you are doing, are doing all of that already. So first, yeah, we looked at the symptoms and the signs and the underlying events through our bedside assessments and our imaging techniques that we have available. But we also need information, as we already said, on the level and type of involvement and disease that has caused the problem. That is the information we typically get from the case history or the EMRs. And if we are really good at doing cranial nerve assessments, and unfortunately not many of us are, but although that is improving, I feel, in the last few years, we can identify level of involvement. So if you're good at doing cranial nerve assessments, you can actually get hints about the level of involvement. But really the majority of that information is from neurology reports or other, other medical professionals reports that we read in the EMR or case history information. And then, as I said earlier, we need to also be able to evaluate, especially for motor rehabilitation targets, what motor components have been affected and how much. And for that, the cranial nerve exam, again, if it's a careful and well done exam, can give you some of that information. But really, uh, ideally, you also need uh, some additional tools. For example, for uh, a correlate of strength, it's a measure of pressures in the oral cavity or in the pharynx through oral and pharyngeal manometry, for example, right? If you are somebody who are, is interested in respiratory strength, you wanna be able to measure those respiratory pressures, right? So that you can also target um, specific values. Um, but how cool would it be? And that's now I'm gonna start talking a little bit more about some of our current work uh, that I'm very excited about. How cool would it be to be able to get most of this information with one tool. Wouldn't it be cool? What do you think, right? Pretty cool. Well, we're getting there. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. And here's actually a tool that we developed a few years ago with a, a really great uh, former mentor and now collaborator, Dr. Brad Sutton at the University of, of Illinois and very talented and brilliant engineer. Um, uh, he and I and a group of his uh, uh, equally talented graduate students uh, several years ago developed a sequence, an MRI sequence that allows us to image the, uh, the brain uh, and take pauses as we do that imaging in order to also at the same time look at uh, how the swallow happens in a dynamic MRI or a real-time MRI video. And I'll show you a video in just a second of what that looks like. And we did a pilot study several years ago, and we were able to identify the brain activity during swallowing pretty robustly, pretty well. And that was based on just a 10 minute MRI scan where the, the subject was doing nothing. They were just asked to relax, watch a movie. And they were, we, were, we were really looking at just the spontaneous swallows. So just uh, we were able to get this really robust and nice activation. 
And then this is what the sequence actually looked like when we were running it in the magnet. So you will see that this is the brain imaging that is happening at the same time. And if you pay attention in this uh, oropharyngeal area, you will be able to identify a bunch of swallows that this patient, this subject actually uh, did during this uh, scanning, which was really, really cool. Now, the, the problem with that sequence at that time was that both the temporal and the spatial resolution, especially for the swallow dynamics was relatively low. So in the last uh, couple of years since COVID started, Brad and I reconnected and are starting to work on this sequence again. And we are now uh, increasing the temporal and spatial resolution. We're starting to be able to scan uh, our pilot subjects uh, up to 30 frames per second. So we're hoping that this will be um, a way to be able to image both what is happening dynamically in the oropharyngeal area, and at the same time, see what's happening uh, in the brain at, uh, at, every, uh, at every single moment in time, which will be something unparalleled that has never happened before. So we're really excited about it. We're also excited to um, collaborate with another uh, brilliant scientist and uh, great anatomist, Dr. Bill Pearson, uh, who has developed the CASM software or the computational analysis of swallowing mechanism software in case some of you may be familiar with this. This uh, system allows us to, um, uh, to basically measure uh, pharyngeal uh, movements and uh, not only uh, how separate structures are moving, but how the entire, uh, what is known morphometry of the pharynx is changing and the oropharynx is changing while people swallow. Um, and so we will be able, and that's a proposal of our big R01 grant that uh, we are resubmitting this July, is to, uh, uh, to be able to measure some of this pharyngeal dynamics at the same time as we measure the brain activity and get some really robust and powerful information about patients. The, the first line of uh, patient population that we want to apply this MRI sequence are acute stroke patients. Acute stroke patients, those of you who work in hospitals and or, uh, uh, or with stroke patients, you probably know this already. They already have kind of, uh, you know, a list of MRI types of scans that they do for their stroke. So uh, what, we're, what we're proposing is to add uh, that 10 minute simul scan MRI uh, on the, the, the already planned MRI sequences that they do. So that it doesn't add too much time, too much extra time. And hopefully will help us uh, with prognosis of those patients in terms of their swallowing function. Uh, and ideally, that's my goal is to also give us information about uh, uh, treatment planning and to know which patient we should be prioritizing and what types of treatments may be better for each uh, individual's patients starting with stroke patients, but as you can imagine, something like this can have really direct and great applications to other types of um, neurogenic patients particularly. All right, but now what about the muscle level? So all that I've been describing is really talking about the peripheral level, what's happening in the oropharynx or in the brain, both very, very important and very cool to be able to do, especially simultaneously, right? But it doesn't really tell us a lot about the muscle level. So how do we get to the muscle level? We, well, the, the main, uh, the main uh, methodology that we have currently is known as electromyography. I am uh, hopeful that most of you are familiar with that, but it is a way to measure um, the neuromuscular activation of a contracting muscle. So as we know, if you remember any of our early neuroanatomy uh, knowledge that we learned in the undergrad and grad school, we know that uh, when muscle fibers activate, they generate action potentials. Those action potentials can actually be read by uh, special equipment, muscle readers known as electrodes. Now, those signals are typically very, very low, very small. So we need some type of amplification process in order to make them readable and to be able to understand them. And there are a couple of different types of electrodes in research, uh, both for in humans and in animal models, as well as in uh, um, uh, for medical diagnosis of neurological conditions, for example, neurologists, a lot of time will use what are known as intramuscular uh, electrodes. Those, and here you see an example of uh, hooked wire uh, intramuscular electrodes applied at the uh, uh, palate area. Uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can get very precise information about uh, you know, specific muscles. 
and can be used, as I said, by neurologists, and they are used diagnostically as well for specific diseases. But um, the reality is that for us clinicians, we primarily use what are known as surface electrodes that allow us, that can be just adhered on the skin, the submental area, or the orofacial area in general, depending on what muscle group you're interested in learning about uh, its muscle activity. Um, but the problem with those is because they are on the skin, not inside the muscle, and because there's so many muscles and overlapping muscles in the orofacial area, they can really not be very precise. So they can give us electrical field activity from multiple muscle groups. Can still be very useful, especially for uh, treatment and biofeedback uh, type of approaches. And I'll share some examples in just a second. But I'm arguing that if, if you know how to use surface electromyography well, and you are trained and you have a good uh, protocol for data collection and analysis, you can also get some really interesting diagnostic and evaluative information that can be, um, can be helpful in, in treatment planning as well. And that's something that we do here uh, very routinely, especially for those patients that are a little bit harder to figure out. We will also do an SEMG evaluation uh, of different orofacial muscle groups. And sometimes that has proven to be uh, very useful in treatment planning. So can SEMG be used for evaluation, evaluating muscle components? And yes, they, as I just said, I believe it can if we have adequate training and a really a good data collection and analysis protocol. Um, what information can it give us? Well, SEMG can give you information about the muscle contraction and the patterns of muscle contraction. You can also get information about the maximum voluntary contraction. You can ask the patient to do a task of maximum effort for example, pushing the tongue to the roof of the mouth as, as hard as they can, or opening the mouth as widely as they can. Those types of activities are really giving you information about muscular effort. So there is a, it's, it's a correlate of, um, uh, of muscular effort, if, if you wish. And, um, but in addition to that, you can also get really interesting information on timing parameters. So how long the muscle contraction lasted will give you information about muscle uh, performance efficiency. You can also do measurements on time to peak, or for example, how long it took from the beginning of the contraction to reach the maximum contraction of a muscle. That gives you information about the reaction time and how well and quick the muscle reacts to a specific stimulus. And importantly, not shown in this picture, um, but you can also get information if you have electrodes recording muscle activity from multiple muscles from, for example, both sides of the right and left or, uh, or multiple muscle groups. So for example, let's say um, the masseter and the submetal muscles at the same time, you can get information, you can do analysis that helps you identify the synchrony or the coordination between these muscle groups or between sides. That can also be, as we're finding out from our work with children with unilateral cerebral palsy, can be extremely helpful both diagnostically and therapeutically as well, because you can use that as a, a biofeedback, uh, biofeedback information. Now, to my knowledge, most commercial clinical systems that are available right now um, cannot provide all of this information. They can give information about the amplitude of activity, maybe some information about timing, but to my knowledge, not all of this information is available in a clinical system. Now, high end, uh, research systems that are available in labs definitely can do these, but, but uh, typically require a lot of time and energy from a lot of students to be able to analyze this data. Uh, what about SEMG for treatment and biofeedback? That's definitely a lot more possible. Here are just some examples of companies that are currently out there that have SEMG systems, either for the clinic or both for in-clinic and uh, at-home use. Um, the, the main, um, you know, a lot of these systems target strength through amplitude of activation. They can target adherence. So if the patient is completing a swallow or not, some of them may also give you information about some timing parameters as well. Unfortunately, as far as I know, unless there's something very new out there that I'm not familiar with, their cost remains rather high, especially for the individual patient and or the individual patient application. And the reality is, and that is true, um, not, not about these specific devices, but that is true among different types of biofeedback tools for a lot of different types of swallowing treatments. 
there is not a lot of clinical efficacy data that are out there. And some systematic reviews that have been recently published on the effect of biofeedback, again, different types of biofeedback for swallowing rehabilitation, are telling us that um, uh, you know, either the trials that are out there are very small, they're very you know, uh, heterogeneous or use heterogeneous samples. So the, they're not very conclusive in terms of is biofeedback good or bad? It makes sense that it would be very useful because biofeedback is needed in order to be able to apply those exercise physiology principles I talked about earlier. Biofeedback is also needed to apply some of the uh, neuroplasticity and motor learning principles that uh, you know, uh, I mentioned earlier as well. So it makes sense and it's logical that it probably will work. But what I'm, what I'm emphasizing here is that we absolutely need to start collecting more clinical efficacy data with uh, some of these systems. So here's where our, our second innovative work comes that we are very excited about. Well, first of all, how cool would it be to evaluate all of these components, target them in treatment, uh, have hopefully an affordable solution, at least uh, for the patient, right? And have some clinical efficacy data. So this is where we're going next. So I bet that would be really cool, just like this little girl is indicating, right? Uh, so a few years ago, a couple of years ago, and some of you probably know this already because it was all over social media uh, and several news outlets, we developed um, uh, a non-invasive wearable, an ultra thin, extremely thin actually, uh, uh, surface EMG sensor patch um, that had adhesive on top of it and could attach just like a sticker on uh, the chin under the, uh, you know, on, on the area under the, under the chin. And it was designed specifically for the uh, muscle sizes and muscle uh, distances uh, that are in the submental area. So physiologically and scientifically it was very, uh, very robust design. Um, and uh, this system that you see here, this patch that you see here, our first generation was connected through this little cable with a wireless small uh, Bluetooth unit. And then the data from the Bluetooth unit could be uh, transferred into um, a, a specialized software that would provide feedback to the patient. A lot of currently available systems do something very similar. Um, the, the main innovation at that time was really the design of the, the sensor patch itself, how easy, it is how you know how thin it is, how cheap it is, extremely cheap to make. Um, and the idea was because affordability is a big thing that I always think about as a clinician um, to ensure that we would we would be able to develop something affordable as well. We completed a validation study, uh, uh, and uh, actually my former PhD student, Dr. Cantor Chigil, who is now a postdoc with Bonnie Martin Harris, um, uh, led this study. And we were able to compare this system um, against commercially available wired electrode systems. The signal quality was pretty equivalent. Uh, we had fewer mild side effects, mainly redness with our sensor compared to the uh, commercial wired sensors. And overall older adults um, reported higher satisfaction, but we also had some problems. We had issues with adherence because we had to add a very strong adhesive. The adherence was super strong. And that meant that every time we replaced the sensor or we took it out uh, from the skin, it was very hard to do so. <laughs> uh, so sometimes that uh, actually had issues, there were issues with durability. A lot of our sensors after two or three times they were used, they were breaking up. Well, that's not an affordable solution, right? Also, it was extremely difficult to place the sensors, uh, for patients to place the sensors on the skin by themselves. They needed a lot of guidance. They needed experimenter, experimenters help and, um, and it took a long time to be able to do that correctly. So since COVID started, we had a lot of time and we started uh, working with additional uh, um, and uh, a new engineering team. And we were able to actually improve the design considerably. And although I can't share too many details about the exact design, overall this sensor that you see here is now thicker, but still remains flexible and very thin. It is not stretchable like the previous one because we identified that across different patient groups and adults, uh, there's very little difference in sizes unless you talk about different age ages. And that's another component that we're considering. We were able to use material that helped us reduce the cost, make the placement much easier for patients. And right now, and we just presented a poster at the 
um, uh, at the DRS meeting a couple of weeks ago, uh, where we had two subjects perform uh, 20, uh, up to 20 treatment sessions, and the, the sensors remained completely intact for all sessions, but signal to noise ratio, which is um, you know, a parameter we look at for signal quality, uh, remained really good for up to 16 sessions for one subject and for 19 sessions for another. Uh, so there's definitely a lot more durability and we are working on, on, on that uh, even more. The, um, importantly, another innovation about this is not just the design of the actual sensor and the ability to, uh, to have one uh, inexpensive sensor patch to collect all the information that you need. Importantly, you also need software to be able to uh, interpret the information well enough and make sure that it is clinically easy to understand and interpret as well. So we have a software code that is now being copyrighted by the Purdue Office of Technology Commercialization. And we are currently preparing the beta version. We have uh, a very, very rough version that is functional, but we are improving it. And with that version, we are able, and the clinicians will be able, in addition to evaluating you know, muscular effort, which most other programs can also do, you will also be able to make measurements on burst duration, time to peak, bilateral synchrony or synchrony between different muscle groups if you choose to do so. Um, also the design, uh, the design we use is for the entire orofacial area. So although now we're optimizing the submental sensor, we are now, we now have uh, finished the design of the uh, peri our perilabial sensor uh, that helps with um, you know, orofac orofacial types of disorders. And uh, it, it's, it's a very easily adjustable design for other areas of the face that are still curvilinear or weirdly shaped. So it can really accommodate uh, a lot of these other areas as well. So lots of exciting things uh, to come. Um, the, where things are right now, we are starting uh, some of our uh, um, additional pilots actually over the summer and we're submitting the R01, the big NIH grant in uh, July. We are trying to remain optimistic on that because we did uh, receive some good reviews in the first submission in the fall. And the IH system, uh, we are just now finishing the validation study and the durability study. Uh, and we're starting the pilot clinical trial over the summer as well, as we're continuing the software development. Our plan, because a lot of people are asking that question. And unfortunately, when you are a full-time academic, things take a little bit longer and you have to find and have a really good business team around you. But I think I'm now there and I'm, I'm really, uh, uh, thinking that within one year, we will be able to uh, have this accessible uh, and be able to use uh, by at least uh, at the testing level by some clinicians. So overall innovations are great, but I do wanna mention and highlight that clinician knowledge of the underlying components of the deficits of our patients are key and understanding the principles that you need to follow in order to be able to use these innovations well these two things together will lead to better patient care. Innovations by themselves, biofeedback by itself is pretty much useless. You need to know how to use it, how to apply it, right, for your patients. And that's why I insisted on the, on the beginning and introductory information, because I think you really need to understand that first. Now, uh, finally, I, I hate to be quoting myself, but actually this is a quote that I wrote in our response to a question on the SIG13 listserv. And since then, many very big leaders in our field, like Bonnie and other people have been citing this. So I kind of think it's, it summarizes things really well that you, know, you really need to think about not just the specific patient, their pathophysiology, but you know, using principles, appropriate principles of exercise physiology, motor learning and neuroplasticity. If you do that in a combined fashion, then the patient outcomes will likely be positive. And it's not about the specific exercises necessarily, or the specific tools that you use. More importantly, the way you chose these exercises and why you chose them and the way you use them and implement them is what is gonna help you be successful with your patients. And with that, uh, I wanna thank uh, Aspire and Dr. Sapienza so much for the very honoring invitation, our funding sources, of course, our lab. Uh, this is our current team, but we have, you know, I wanna thank all of our lab team members through the years. And those of you who are interested in contacting us or learning more about us, please feel free. Here are, uh, here's our contact information. Thank you. Oh, Dr. Melandraki, that was great. And, and there's a ton of questions coming in, lots of information here. So if you don't mind sticking with us yeah, for, absolutely, for a little bit. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. 
Well, and I appreciate you uh, acknowledging Aspire products. Uh, Aspire puts on these webinars for our clinicians. They're they're free, obviously, and I think they're very informative. And we try to bring as many people into the into the field that we can that to help spread the knowledge that we know through through science. So thank you for all of your innovative work. Importantly, the email address there. You have a few folks coming in, you know, wondering if they can be a part of your pilot. If you need them as research uh, sites for your particular uh, and future, we know, NIH award that you'll get coming down the pike. We, we, yeah. we hope that that will come true. Yeah. So you do have some people and folks, the information. Yeah. I, is, uh, please is there. email me. I have a list. I, you know, when the first generation sensor uh, was up there, I, we, we did have a lot of interest. Unfortunately, at that time, because the sensor was not optimized, we were not ready yet, but I think we are very, very close now. So absolutely, we will be interested and we'll be looking for more sites. So uh, if you are interested, please contact me and I, I have a list and uh, I will be reaching out to at least some of you. Of course, as you can imagine, we can't reach out to everybody, but that right. is wonderful that there is interest in that. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. So now for the tough questions. You ready? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so the tough question. So I think first, you know, we talk always talk about, you know, the traditional uh, video fluoro swallow and I think you elucidated, you know, that that is, that Do is. Do you want me to stop sharing? Sorry. Oh, no, you can leave it up. It's, okay, it's okay, fine. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Um, uh, talk about the patient populations. People are asking about, well, what about patients with vocal fold paralysis? What about patients that have myotonic dystrophy? You know, obviously <clears throat> stroke, right? So yep. can you talk a little bit about the utilization across multiple yeah. patient populations? Is there limitations? Yeah, well, absolutely. And that's why I said that, you know, you really need to think about the level of involvement and the type of involvement of the nervous system. Uh, and it's because, you know, the reality is, although I said, you know, our goal is true recovery, that's not possible for a lot of our patients. So for our, some of our patients, really the goal is maintenance of performance for as long as possible, right? Right. Uh, uh, you know, so I think, I think that's why it's really important to understand the underlying disease really well and the pathophysiology of that disease because that will determine how you apply some of these principles. But the reality is that even for example, and we don't know much about that, in at least in the swallowing world yet, you know, uh, but slowly there is definitely more and more evidence being accumulated. Um, but the, the reality is that as, as time goes by, we're learning more and more that even for patients that have, you know, myotonic dystrophy or some of, uh, uh, you know, more progressive type of disorders, uh, even some of the quickly uh, degenerating disorders, there could be, and if you talk to most neurologists, at least I've talked to, they all agree that there could be some windows of time in the disease processes where there may be some, you know, uh, uh, some opportunity to do some form of muscle performance training. That doesn't have to be though, the traditional strength training that we have in mind, let's go and get really bulky and, you know, uh, let, let's get really strong. That, that, that's not always the case. And actually, so for example, I'll give you an example of uh, a group of patients that we see a lot in our clinic. I don't know why, I've only published one paper on that, but because of that paper, we get a lot of referrals. We see a lot of patients with um, um, uh, different types of myositis. So inclusion body myositis, dermatomyositis, and things like that. And for those patients, if you read the literature, there is very little on what uh, you know, muscle performance training, for example, can do for right. them. Right. But the reality is that the way that that had been applied um, wasn't necessarily uh, following the underlying pathophysiology of the disease. If you, if, you, if you look at those disease processes and you identify yeah, there's inflammation in those muscles. So if I strength train them really hard, I'm gonna inflame them even more. So probably I'm not gonna get the result I want, but maybe those are the types of people we need to think more about maintenance or endurance training. Right. Which is at a lower load level, exactly. but for a longer period of time. And essentially swallowing is an endurance act. A lot of people say that, and I agree with them. It's not really, you don't need maximum tongue strength to swallow effectively, you know? Uh, but you probably need endurance to be able to finish a meal. Right? So for a lot of these other patients, these, a lot of these principles are still at, uh, very, very applicable, but you have to think about the underlying pathophysiology as well 
in how to apply them. That's why I said you really need to think about all of these different levels. Um, well, and, I, and, you and know, we you need know, more data. And we yeah, need more data. I mean, so. <laughs> clearly, I think our listeners, you know, yeah. always you have to understand pathophysiology that is going to guide all of the choice. When I think about swallowing, I think of it as is strength and endurance, ballistic yeah, as well yeah. as you know strength over time, yeah, which is yeah. which is endurance, and I think you've yeah. explained that well. So I want to dig down on on the new um, equipment, you know, that you're, you're talking about your your patch, your your EMG yeah. patch. Signal to noise ratio doesn't change over time. When people have used these patches in the past, it's all about pre post. You know, I want to document yeah. what happens before and after. How do I, with your system, ensure that the placement is reliable yeah. as a clinician? Is there a way that you're marking? Great question. Yeah. How, how do we do that? Yeah. So here, here's, and that's what, one of the reasons we worked on this, uh, you know, more, because placement was very tough. <laughs> and I think it is tough uh, in the independent placement of any of those sensors, right? No matter so, what, no matter what, right? No matter what, exactly. So one thing that we did that has been uh, helping significantly is we added, if you, if you look at the design, the initial design was more kind of like a, almost like a square design, right? Versus this one is kind of like a triangular design. And the reason for that is because we've actually added the ground sensor on, mm. the, on the device. Okay. And that is, has to be on the chin. So we are uh, using, we are using that dually. First of you all- You got a reference point. We don't, you got a reference point. We have point. a reference point. It works well. We tried, it was like, will it work? I don't know. It works really well, number one. Number two, it has helped tremendously with placement because as long as they can, you know, be able to do that, and sometimes they will maybe need a mirror to be able to make sure, right? But most mm -hmm. people can do that. And then, then you're just basically just applying pressure to the rest of the patch. Okay, that makes so, a lot of sense. So I so hope everybody is, heard that. Yeah, you're using yeah. the triangular portion of that design to reference the tip of the chin, and that will help improve the reliability of placing that patch. Signal quality and the reliability of placement, yes. So that's beautiful, that, that's a smart design, everybody. That, that, that nails it right there. Right. <laughs> so the, somebody had asked, and I thought this was a really good point about the, the use of the SMEMG you know, patch. Can you, do you think in your mind that that's a good way to track, let's say the dosing? of a protocol. So uh, for example, if we're, we're trying to, if we are trying to work on, it doesn't matter whether it's strength or endurance because mm -hmm. strength, that's a strength over time. Yep. Do, do you see that as a, as a way to, to provide biofeedback about conditioning and, and threshold of the training? Yes, I, I definitely do that. I, but I do think that in order for that to be reliable, to happen reliably, we, we, we probably need uh, a component of data science to be added to this. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will need to collect enough data because you know the, the issue with the SMG is that the, they're very sensitive, right, right? To the signal that is being acquired. So in order to make sure that what is being acquired is actually the, you know, the, the correct type of uh, muscle activity we were targeting through the prescribed exercise or you know, uh, a program or protocol that you used, we need to make sure that we uh, we can identify that really well, and I, I think the the way to do that, and that's one of the parameters we are we want to add, is, and that's where we will need a lot of different clinical sites to be able to collect a lot of data together to to, to be able to build a, a, a data science team and be able to to come to those conclusions. Uh, quite a few people are going there. That I think that's probably the future of those types of signals. Uh, and, and in order to be able to be interpreted more, uh, you know, more reliably. So I think it is possible, but I think we will need to do additional, um, some additional work on that. So Dr. Malandraki, would that also relate to figuring out how to norm normalize these uh, yep. signals? For example, if yep. I'm a 20 year old versus a 70 year old, like one, of the, one of the questions that came in is, how do you develop normative data? with this yeah. so that you can determine whether your signal is abnormal. Yeah, well, it's extremely hard to, develop, to, to collect uh, normative data with a, a device like this and with SEMG in general. And one of the reasons is because anytime, um, because of the, of the nature of the SEMG signal and a lot of what normative data are out there, I would be very cautious about them 
because they have point. been collected, you know, so I would be very careful. So I've, read all, I've read all of those papers. The reality is that every time you use an SMG system, you need to renormalize it. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, in order to be, to make sure that you are, you know, uh, you're actually interpreting the system well. So that's another, another issue sometimes with some, at least from what I've, I've, uh, I've heard or I've seen from some other. Can I frame the question a different way? And, yeah. You know, yeah. you and I have known each other long enough. We can yeah. ping back and forth like this. And I think it makes it more interesting for those that are listening. Let me frame it a different way. Yeah. If I took, if I took a thousand 20 year olds. Yeah. And I had them swallow the same bolus size and type. Yeah. Would I not reach a similar amplitude and timing of that swallow? You would reach a similar percent of the mac of, the, of their mac, mac of their maximum amplitude. Okay. So that's so, why I'm talking so about normalization. You first need to normalize that if, because otherwise you will not. Yes, I hear what you're saying. So you're normalizing it to the individual first. You have to normalize it to a maximum voluntary contraction act first. And unfortunately, as far as I know, you need to do that every time. Yeah. Now that is fortunate and fortunate in some ways. Uh, So that's that's one of the one of the reasons that clinicians need to be very careful if they're setting up a goal in the beginning, they and you are using an SMG system, they have to make sure that. the, the value that they use to, to, to set up that goal, they have to remeasure it next time they use it, just to make sure. Yeah, and so it could so, be very close, but it's it's not it's not necessary that it would not be. identical. So in the in the computer hardware that you'll be providing with this new innovation, yeah. I would imagine then there's like a calibration task. There's a normalization pro- the, the yes. first the first page is the normalization page. She's got it all here, folks. Dr. Melandraki hasn't missed well, Let's let's hope, let's hope you know things go well. You know, you, you, I, I told you earlier, the Greek in me always thinks of <laughs> the next <laughs> negative thing that may happen. But over so far, and that's why I'm very excited about this because I feel like we created it, and a lot of the people behind this, I you know, I didn't talk much about it, but you know, the main person who trained me on SMG is Ann Smith. Yeah. And if anybody knows Ann Smith, she's the you know the world-renowned electrophysiologist for the head and neck. So. When I came here and I showed her what I do with SMG, she said, Georgia, that's horrible. You, <laughs> you know, she was very, very frank. And yeah. she taught me from the beginning and it was really eye-opening. And that's why I'm very, very cautious about some of the former publications on SMG. It's great that people use them, but I don't think that everybody knew exactly how to interpret the signals well. Right, I agree. And and for, for you know, we, we tend to show our age when we talk about the great mentors that we had. And when I saw her on some of the work you were doing, I was going to ask you before this started, is that the great Ann Smith? Yes, and it, that's and, the great and, Ann Smith. Yeah, yeah. So congratulations yeah. Uh, yeah. To, to you on that. Well, I think, you know, you're, you're certainly an inspiration to everyone. I mean, the, the comments coming in are uh, tons of gratitude for your work. Thanks for, you know, continuing to be innovative. There's so much coming out of your lab at Purdue from all of your students. And now we see them in, in postdocs, your presidency for DRS, your service, um, you know, to the field. Um, you, you've just shared so, so much tonight. Where can people continue to yeah. follow you, learn more as, as this evolves. I think yeah. that's important. Well, definitely. I, I think, you know, my lab students who are wonderful are, are you know, are, are making sure we're pretty active on social media most of the time. And if, if not, it's because of, I'm delaying to say, yes, you can put that on. Uh, so yeah, social media, as I've, I've said, is one way also, of course, you know, feel free to email me at any point. I apologize beforehand if, if I delay answering, but it's the, uh, the amount of emails some days is a little bit overwhelming. Um, you can also see our lab website uh, and uh, we try to update it a couple of times a year as well. So a lot of new information, but I would say probably the more up to date would be social media nowadays, uh, the truth is. Uh, and then of course we try to uh, present a lot of this information you know, to DRS every year, which is you know, a great conference even for clinicians uh, uh, and, uh, or to the European Society uh, Swallowing Disorders Conference, the ESSD. So we try to be as active and present as possible. Uh, but yeah, at any point, feel, please feel free to contact me if you're interested in learning more, uh, have ideas about your patients or questions about your patients. I'm always, I always love talking to, uh, although, first of all, I am a clinician still. I, although I do not, because of time practice on a weekly basis, I, eval- 
I help our clinicians uh, uh, evaluate patients once a month. So I, I, I feel that that's very, very important to, for my research to be a good teacher as well. So I always love talking to clinicians about patients and trying to help as much as I can. So feel free to be in touch and, uh, and yeah, follow us on social media. Definitely uh, try to have all the updates there. Okay, so one last question for the evening because there's, there's just too many to get through and that is to talk about your patients. Is this inpatient application, outpatient application? How do you see it rolling in the future? I think it could be both. It could also be home-based application. It was designed as a home-based application. That was my initial. So when I first had this idea in you know, 2013, 14, um, it, it was really designed because I could see that my patients, when I was giving them homework, I didn't feel that was working well. <laughs> you know, the sheets of homework that we typically give. So that was kind of the, the motivation behind it. What can we give them so that they can at least be able to more reliably do what, you know, do what they're asked to do. Um, and so I can definitely see it as a home-based solution, uh, of course, with the guidance of the clinician. I'm not talking replacing the clinician by any means. I hope I persuaded you on that, that I believe the clinician I, I think is you, I very think important, did, yeah. right? Um, but yeah, I can definitely see it uh, as a very easy solution for the inpatient setting. You know, in the inpatient setting, and because I've worked, uh, that's the main setting I've worked uh, at other than outpatient here in the university clinic, um, you know, a lot of times you would see a patient really quickly, you would do an eval, you would want them to start doing something, but you didn't have time. Well, now you will be able to, with something like this, you will be able to prescribe something, you'll be able to have access to the data, which I didn't talk about, through a cloud server to your own computer. So you will also be able to, to monitor that um, from a distance if you didn't have time to go back to the room, for example, and be able to see, are they doing it? Are they not doing it? Are they doing it well or not? So oh, I can tremendous. definitely see I can definitely see it as an application in the inpatient setting, but I do, I, I, I wanna go back to, you know, uh, what we said earlier, that for all of these things, you know, I'm very optimistic, you know, of course I'm biased, like we all are for our own tools and things that we develop, but, and that's why I think it's very important to also collect the data to support that. So I feel it could be used both in the inpatient and outpatient setting, but definitely we need the data to show that. Yeah, and there's no, there's no, you know, doubt that you know people that develop, you're you're going to be biased, but you put a lot of science behind it. You got a lot of people interested in wanting to use the tool, and you know, I'm, I'm a betting woman. I'm going to say that uh, you know when it all comes down and the data gets collected, as we've seen, you know, from great innovative work, you, you know, I always tell the clinicians, read the science, read the science, you know, go to, go yeah. back to the to the evidence base. But I, I think your product's going to be a, a real winner here. And I think you've you've also been honest to elucidate, you know, what the pros and cons are of the current systems we have, and and how you're how you're working to better that. So, um, I can't thank you enough. Uh, yeah. Thanks for can sharing. I, your can I can I take one minute to answer? Oh, I, I see I see a question. Right? Yeah. And I'm not going. I can't answer it specifically, but there's a question about price point. Yes. And okay. I, and I do. And I did. I I meant. I think I mentioned it briefly during the presentation, but I want to. I want to mention it again. Of course, of course, right now it's not commercial yet, so I can't really tell you a price point. But because, again, uh, one of the biggest motivations was to make sure that we have something that patients could use, uh, you know, in the in the near future, in my lifetime, not after my lifetime, hopefully, <laughs> as a researcher. Um, you know, the I, I thought very hard about the revenue model, and that's one of the reasons why we created the sensor as cheap as possible is to make it as cheap as possible for the end user. Now, the, the other components of so the wireless unit and the software, they will have a cost because otherwise you don't, unfortunately, you don't have a business, you can't really sell anything. But the good thing about that is that, that uh, those, those components can be reused across patients. Right. So, the, 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 so and, and that was, uh, I just wanted to mention that all of that when, all of that thought process went into place because I wanted to make sure that if we are going to design this, it's going to be as affordable as possible, especially for the end user. And yes, we will be working on reimbursement as well. Yeah, fantastic. You know, and 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 as you commercialize something, all of that sort of falls into place. And and you know, things about you know how you store, how you clean, yep. you know, where you where you find your data, how to share your data. It sounds like you've got that all in the works. So any other last comments, Dr. Melandraki, before we 
leave each no, other. I, 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 no, I, I'm just very thankful to, to be part of this webinar series. Uh, um, you know, Aspire and you guys through your science and your careful clinical work do some amazing uh, amazing things that are helping our patients. We use our devices all the time in our clinic. So thank you for that. And uh, I thank everybody for participating and please stay in touch. All right. Thanks everybody. Have a, have a safe and enjoyable evening. Thanks again, Dr. Melandraki. Just amazing thank work. Thank you, thank you, so, you much. so much. Thank you. Take care. Thanks.